It is the early morning of August 25th, 1758, an exceptionally hot day. As the Prussian columns marched along the river bank, intending to flank the Russians, a hussar scout hastily approached Frederick the Great. He told the king the Russians did not realize they were being flanked in time and left their entire baggage train behind their front lines. It stood there, ready to be mopped up. It would be a decisive blow and would not even warrant a battle. Frederick, angered at the destruction the Russians inflicted on the countryside, did not act on this information. Instead, he spurred his army onwards. The Battle of Zorndorf, described as one of the bloodiest battles of the 18th century, was about to commence. After the disastrous ambush at Domstattel, Frederick abandoned the siege of Olmutz. He returned to the fortress of Glatz. Austrian Field Marshal Dorn, notorious for his patient and cautious campaigning, did pursue the Prussians. However, he did so at a pace you would expect. The retreat from Moravia was orderly and even allowed Frederick to launch small counterattacks against the Austrian vanguard. The British envoy described it as the retreat of a lion, keeping his enemies at bay. The disaster and the implications of the campaign should not be underestimated. Nobody at that time knew the ambush of Domstattel marked the end of Frederick's final attempt to invade the Habsburg monarchy. The year was far from over. To Prussia's northeast, an army arguably just as dangerous as the Austrians and certainly more brutal advanced. By August, the Russians, commanded by General Firmer, advanced from the east towards Küstrin, a strategically vital stronghold protecting Frederick's capital, Berlin. Some 26,000 Prussians held Küstrin. They were heavily outnumbered. Frederick understood the seriousness of the situation, so he gathered his army, some 11,000 soldiers, and embarked on a speed march against Firmer. He planned to beat the Russians, turn to Silesia and face Dawn. Frederick began his march on August 11. Four days later, Firmer reached Küstrin and began its bombardment, while his Cossack detachments plundered neighboring settlements. After one week of heavy shelling, Frederick's army arrived in the region. The Prussians marched over 250 kilometers in 12 days. Like before at the Battle of Leuten, the Prussian military proved tenacious. Their arrival prompted Firmer to abandon the bombardment and take positions to the north. Frederick approached through the devastated Küstrin and neighboring villages, inciting a fierce hatred and yearning for revenge among the Prussian soldiers. The writings of a Prussian soldier survive. We were all smoldering with anger over the destruction of Küstrin and the sufferings of the poor country people. The enemy had wasted and destroyed everything and even broken into churches and robbed them. Many of the people had been horribly injured or even killed by the Cossacks' whips. As Firmer moved away from Küstrin, Frederick followed him on the other bank of the river. The maneuvering directly preceding the Battle of Zorndorf lasted nearly two days. The Prussians camped nearby a tributary of the Oder, the Mietzel. On the other side of the river camped Firmer with his army. Both sides commanded considerable numbers of soldiers, but when Firmer learned of Frederick's approach, he mistakenly assumed part of the Prussians would approach his south. So he sent a detachment of around 11,000 soldiers down south to protect a river crossing. It left Firmer with around 43 to 45,000 soldiers, 36,500 infantry, 3,500 cavalry, 3,000 Cossacks, and 136 artillery pieces. These were deployed in roughly two lines stretching to Quarchen between two protective hollows, the Zaberngund and the Langerngund facing north. Frederick commanded around 36,000 soldiers, about 10,500 cavalry and 25,500 infantry and 193 artillery pieces. The terrain around Zorndorf was characterized by marshes and bogs. 
small contingents of Prussian engineers installed pontoon bridges to the camp's east. From the camp, Frederick could see some Russians. The thick vegetation made it difficult to assess their exact positions, however. That night, the Prussian army camped nearby Darmitzel, a village nearby the installed pontoon bridges. Frederick used local forestry experts to guide his army through the boggy terrain. He decided on a long approach, protected by cavalry on the flanks. At 3 a.m., the infantry began its march through the forest along the Russian flank. The cavalry traveled further away from the front lines. Along their march, they passed burning and looted villages. The Russians were quick to realize their enemy was on the move. Vermeer initially deployed his force facing north towards the Prussian camp. He now rotated his army to face the other way. Marshy terrain now enveloped his rear. No retreat would be possible. The Prussian vanguard had long passed Batslow, and many were already approaching their final positions when scouts notified Frederick of a lucky break. Not just any lucky break, but one that could potentially win them the battle. Drawn up nearby Groskamin stood the entire Russian baggage train. Because Firmer mistakenly presumed the battle would take place to his north, the baggage train stood in their front instead far in their rear. Destroying the carriages would force the Russians to leave the region, for they would be undersupplied. But Frederick refused to act on this information, holding strong contempt for the Russians and seeking military victory. By 9 a.m., the Prussian army reached their final positions, and immediately Colonel von Muller's artillery opened fire. An artillery duel lasting two hours followed. It appeared neither side broke. By 11 a.m., the Prussians launched a staggered attack from their left. Here, they concentrated most of their power throughout the battle. Artillery in front of Zorndorf continued launching volleys as General Manteuffel charged ahead against the Russian right flank. The remainder of the infantry under Lieutenant General Kanitz advanced to his right rear. Far behind followed Bieberstein's cavalry, and across the river, Seidlitz's cavalry followed parallel to Manteuffel's army. As this flank advanced, the Prussian right remained stationary, preventing any other Russian contingents from coming to their right flank's aid. Soon, things went wrong. The Prussian artillery had multiple Russian powder weapons. The explosions were deafening and smoke filled the air. This cluttered the infantry's vision, leaving them to be sitting ducks. The Russian infantry launched volleys from point-blank range against the haphazardly advancing Prussians. Kanitz's infantry fell behind and pulled too far to the right, as their commander was afraid he would suffer a charge from the Russian center. But this exposed Manteuffel's right flank. The Russian cavalry did not hesitate a moment and launched a charge. The charge against the vanguard was merciless and relatively unopposed. As a result, some units reportedly lost two-thirds of their men before retreating in an uncoordinated rout. In utter panic, Frederick ordered Seidlitz to attack and relieve the infantry. Seidlitz allegedly replied, Tell the king that after the battle, my head is at his disposal, but until then I will do as I see fit. Thanks to Manteuffel's retreat, Kanitz's left flank was exposed. The front on the left was too broad. Upon their fleeing, Russian artillery bombarded the infantry with volleys. In an iconic moment, Frederick decided to pick up a standard to stop the panicked troops from retreating, a scene immortalized by Karl Rückling's painting. Some units remained, augmented by Bieberstein's cavalry plugging the left flank. Things did not look good for the Prussians. To the right, General Dona's army moved forward to protect Kanitz's exposed right flank. But before they advanced further, General Thomas von der Miku launched a counterattack against Dona's infantry and Schirlmer's cavalry. Saltikov's infantry joined soon after. This was the moment Seidlitz was waiting for. The center would not reinforce the Russian right. He ordered his 36 squadrons of cuirassiers and hussars to launch a charge across the steep slopes of the Zabernkund. The mix of Russian cavalry and infantry mowing away against Kanitz did not expect the cavalry to complete this maneuver in such a quick and agile manner. Surprised and confused, they suffered the brunt of Seidlitz's charge. A brief skirmish erupted, but the Prussian cavalry bested the Russians. Their entire right flank collapsed and fled in disorder. Some fled to the woods behind Quarchen, others to the center, 
many to their camps, which they plundered for brandy. The Russian right and Prussian left flank spent the remainder of the battle mopping up scattered Russian units. Frederick levied two of Seidlitz's squadrons to reinforce the center. The combat was exceptionally savage. Brutal battle, drunkenness and carnage littered the battlefield. Both sides ran out of gunpowder and savage hand-to-hand -hand combat ensued. Both sides used their bayonets to try and beat their enemies as the battle lines became more disorganized over time. It continued for hours. By 8.30 p.m., the fighting nearly disintegrated both armies. The Central Command undoubtedly broke down. Frederick tried to summon enough troops to launch one final charge against the Russians nearby the Galgengrund, but to no avail. Dona's men now held the original Russian position, whereas the Russians were pushed towards Zorndorf. By 9 p.m., darkness fell and the fighting ceased, apart from a few scattered skirmishes. The battle had been more confusing, cluttered and prolonged than usual. Frederick moved his army to Wilkersdorf, while Firmer created a defensive perimeter at Zorndorf. Tim Blenning wrote that the Russians suffered 42% and the Prussians 35% casualties, an enormous number. The Prussians lost nearly 13,000 men, around 3,700 dead. 7,200 wounded and 1,900 prisoners. The Russians lost over 20,000 men, 6,600 killed, over nearly 12,000 wounded and 2,500 prisoners were missing. Because of the enormous number of casualties, neither side could follow up the situation. That night, the Russian army withdrew, shrouded in darkness. Frederick was in no position to pursue them. Contemporaries describe the Battle of Zorndorf as one of the bloodiest of the 18th century. The brutality of the battle stuck out, and the fact the Russians did not retreat despite suffering so many casualties and a significant number of friendly fire incidents struck with the Prussians. Both sides claimed victory, and both Berlin and St. Petersburg celebrated as such. Frederick sent letters to friends and family claiming he inflicted 30,000 casualties against a Russian force numbering over 80,000. Frederick's confidence and feeling of superiority proved to be misplaced. A Saxon artillery captain, Johann Gottlieb Tilke, who served the Russians, remarked, The extraordinary steadiness and intrepidity of the Russians on this occasion is not to be described. It surpassed everything that one has heard of the bravest troops. Although the Prussians' balls mowed down whole ranks, yet not a man discovered any symptoms of unsteadiness or inclination to give way and the openings in the first line were instantly filled up from the second or the reserve. Military historians prolifically criticized Frederick for the needless slaughter among his men and the Russians. The consensus is that the battle would have been over before it even started if he had captured the Russian baggage train. It would force the Russians to retreat to more fertile regions. Historians also agree that Zorndorf marked Frederick the indescribable carnage of the battle and the preceding pillaging left the king both angered and impressed with his adversary. Because of the absolute terror inflicted on the surrounding countryside, there was nothing for the Russians to extract. They decided to retreat to the east. Their retreat was stimulated by a conflict between the Austrians and Russians. Firmer, rightly, was angered at the lack of support from his Austrian allies. The fact the Austrian envoy openly doubted his command abilities did certainly not help. Firmer retreated to the Baltic coast, laid siege to some insignificant fortresses, and did not attempt to invade any more. In that sense, the battle was a victory for the Prussians. The Austrian lack of action was because they were busy in the west. Dorn prepared an attack against Saxony. The Battle of Hochkirch would not happen for another month but the battle pitted 36,000 Prussians against 80,000 Austrians. An incredible discrepancy, and the battle would enter history books as one of Frederick the Great's greatest blunders. Thank you so much for watching this video. If 
there's a topic, person, battle or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and all my channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements and your name will be featured at the end of every video. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.